Father's Day to all you fathers out there. And happy grandfathers. I'm one of those grandfathers. Come Wednesday, my family from uh, Phoenix, Arizona is coming in. My daughter-in-law and five grandchildren, and they're going to be with us for six weeks. So I'm going to be doing a lot of grandfathering. We need help, and we need prayer. But it's going to be great to see them again. We've been studying in the letter of uh, First Timothy, this letter written by Paul to Timothy, which teaches us about the church. And we've seen that there are three beautiful pictures of the church, and we've been dealing with the first picture of the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ, which is in the first two chapters, and it's, it's all about the lighthouse. The church as a lighthouse is committed to declaring the truth of the gospel. And we've been singing some gospel hymns this morning. Wasn't that great? To be able to sing some of those old gospel hymns of the faith that really point to the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Savior of sinners. And this is what the church needs to do. It needs to shine the light of God's truth and especially the gospel, the good news of salvation to this dark world. And there are three aspects of the gospel, and we've already considered one of them, and that is in the opening verses of 1 Timothy chapter 1, and that's the gospel of God. How that God is a lover, and that the whole plan of redemption was given birth in the heart and mind of God long before the foundation of the world. God intended to bring love to humanity. And he knew that humanity was sin and he knew that they would need a savior and so the whole plan of redemption and the whole plan of Jesus Christ coming to save us was thought out and brought out at that time. In love, God predestined us to become his children. And God wants you to become his child this morning. That's the gospel of God. Now the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is what we're talking about this morning, chapter 1, verse 12 to 19 or 20. And then the gospel of the work of Christ, which is next week in chapter 2. The good news of God's love. Now this is the truth concerning the gospel. It is not sufficient just to believe that God loves you. Now, it is the truth that God loves you, and that's the beginning of salvation, but it's certainly not the end of it. Because when you come to God and you say, God, I want to receive your love, I want to believe in you, God will say, go and talk to my son. Go and talk to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So not only must we believe that God loves us, but we must also meet Jesus and choose to receive him as our Savior, to believe in him as our Lord. And now we've got the real deal. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but through me. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John 3 verse 36 says this, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not believe in the Son does not have life. It's very clear. So somewhere along the line, if we're to be saved and to receive all the blessedness of the gospel and the salvation gift that God has to offer to us, we must meet Jesus. There's no other way. There's no other way that we can get to heaven without coming through Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the door. By me, if anyone enter in, he shall find life. You've got to come to the door, and the door is Jesus. Jesus is the lighthouse. Don't miss him. He is the one who is shining for us, and he's showing the, us the way to God, and we must come to him in faith and believe in him, and we will be saved. Have you met the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a question. Who have you met in in your life? Have you met any famous people? I bet we have a few stories here today, some great stories about people that we've met as we've gone through life. Some amazing people, some perhaps some very famous people. And you have your stories and I have mine. I've met a few famous people in my time and the first one I want to tell you about 
is Kenneth Kaunda. Kenneth Kaunda was the president of Zambia from about 1964, at the, when Zambia became a sovereign nation, until about uh, 1989 or 1990. So he had a long tenor as the president of Zambia, and he's one of the most outstanding statesmen that Africa has produced. He came and he visited our little hospital, at Chitokoloki Hospital, and uh, there was, uh, you know, him and me and the, all the huge crowd, but then he got in my Land Rover, and I drove him down to the Leprosarium, which is about a mile away from the hospital, and it was him and me in the car. I was thinking to myself, my goodness me, I'm driving a big wig. This guy is uh, known all over Africa, and, and, and uh, people, he's politically involved with people all over the world. Wow, you know, I was feeling pretty good. And he asked me how I was doing, and we had a nice conversation. He's quite a nice, quite a nice man. That was about 1978. In 1980, we came home on furlough, and while I was traveling to various places, we were in the Detroit Metropolitan Airport, and I had a personal meeting with Johnny Cash. Now, I'm sorry to have to tell you, it wasn't in a very wonderful place. We, we met in the men's washroom. But there he was, Johnny Cash, and he was dressed in black, and uh, he was there. We, you know, to the old men come, we went to the washroom. And uh, uh, there, there was only the two of us there. And so I was really busted to say something, but I couldn't think of anything great to say. So all I said was, are you Johnny Cash? And he said, nope. Well, he was, but I couldn't think of any reply. So that was the end of the meeting. About 1981, I was at the Urbana, well, I guess this was back in 1977. It was at, I was at the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Every three years, they have the Urbana Conference at the University of Illinois Fieldhouse in Urbana, Illinois. 25,000 people there, and Billy Graham was the chief speaker. And I thought to myself, boy, it would be really nice to be able to meet Billy Graham. But there were tons of people around him all the time, and, and uh, so to be able to press through the crowd was, was nigh on impossible. So one evening after he had spoken, I thought, I'm just going to duck down through a doorway and try to get back to the, to the bottom, into the bowels of the, of the field house, and see if somehow I can meet Billy Graham, because I know he's not going to come out through the auditorium, he's going to go backstage and go down somewhere. Well, I went down the stairs, and I went down another set of stairs, and I opened the door, and I got into what looked like a parking lot, and I heard a voice just around the corner, and it said, Mr. Graham, you just wait here. The limousine will be here in a couple of minutes to pick you up. And I walked around the corner, and there was Billy Graham standing there with no crowds. It was just him and me. So I went up to him, and I said, Hi, I'm Jim Reddy. He said, Hi, I'm Billy Graham. And I said, What a blessing that you've been in my life and in my family's life. We prayed for you since we were kids. And uh, I just want to know that uh, you've blessed my life. And he said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a missionary in Zambia. And he put out his hand on my shoulder and he said, God bless you. Oh, I felt like I'd been blessed by the Pope. <laughs> it was great. You know, those are meetings with very important people, very famous people at least. But all these meetings that I've experienced in my life pale into insignificance compared to the time when I was 10 years old, when in the middle of the night, in the darkness of my own bedroom at home, down in Bell River in, in Essex County, I called out to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there I met the sovereign of the universe. I met the Son of God. The most important meeting I've ever had in my life. And that night I called out and I asked Jesus to save me, and he saved me. And ever since then, I've been able to walk with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Not because of my importance, 
but because of his grace and because of his mercy. So his, who is this Jesus? In uh, chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, we get a little intimation of it. If you will look at 1 Timothy, his, his name is mentioned in, in verse 1 and in verse 2. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I want you to put on your thinking caps and consider this. God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And you know they're put together without any explanation in both verses. In both verses, God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope. Now it would be sort of like this. If Stephen Harper had sent out an invitation to the G20 summit, and he addressed it this way to all the great leaders of the nations of the world, at least those who were invited. I understand there's more than 20 nations coming. There's about 36. People are breaking into the party. But... Uh, if Stephen Harper had sent out the invitation and it read this way, Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister of Canada, and James Rennie, that's my official name, invite you to the G20 Summit, June 25th and 26, 2010, at Toronto, Ontario, Canada. You would say, what's going on? And maybe the, the leaders of the nations be scratching their head. Who would they be asking about? Well, we know this guy, Stephen Harper, but who is James Rennie? Well, he mustn't be a nobody because he has equal billing. He has equal billing. Equal billing indicates equality. And whenever letters in the New Testament are introduced, Jesus always gets equal billing with the Father. Equal billing. That gives us an indication of the, of, of the person that we're dealing with, Jesus Christ equal with the Father. Now, what's in the name? Because in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Christ Jesus, our hope. In verse 2, he says, Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then down in verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that's the full name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. What's in a name? What a wonderful name he has. And how it indicates his greatness and his glory. Because the word Christ means anointed one. Anointed one. And the Jews use the word Messiah. We've been singing about Messiah. The anointed one. And, uh, and, and pious Jews who would read through the Old Testament would see the truth. That this one was going to be totally unique. The one anointed to be Messiah would be totally unique. And it says in, in Micah chapter 1, his going forth has been from everlasting. In other words, he would be an eternal person. And we know him as nothing less than God, the anointed one. Jesus was the name that was given to him at his birth, not by his father, or by his earthly, not by his earthly father, or by his earthly mother, but by God himself. The angel came and told Joseph and told Mary what to call their son. He was, he's going to be called Jesus. Now there's a lot of people who call themselves Jesus, but they're called by earthly father and mother that name. Jesus was given his name by God. Why? Because it means something great. It means Jehovah Savior. Jehovah was that relational name of God in the Old Testament. In other words, Jesus is receiving the name that God uses of himself. Just Jehovah, Savior. And then Lord, well, that means master. It means sovereign. And all three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, at one point or another in the scriptures are all called Lord, they're all the sovereign, they're all the master. So we see from Jesus' name the exalted status that he has in the scriptures. And Lou Warrett has been preaching to us so wonderfully from the Gospel of John and the Gospel of John 
makes no bones about it. Jesus is the, the great I am. Jesus is the exalted Son of God. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Now in our, in our uh, chapter here, we have a meeting between a man and Jesus. And it's the Apostle Paul himself, who was known formerly as Saul, who meets Jesus. And he gives his testimony as to how he met Jesus. And we're going to look at his testimony a little bit. But who was Paul or Saul? In Philippians chapter 3, I'm just, uh, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to make reference to Paul's words concerning himself. This is his description of himself. He says in verse uh, 4 of chapter 3 of Philippians, he says, If anyone thinks he has reason to put confidence in his natural person, his flesh, I have more. I was circumcised the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In other words, I'm a true son of the Hebrews. Such a proud heritage. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees were the strictest sect of the Hebrews. They're the people who followed the laws of God to the T, and they were so avid at following the law that where there wasn't a law, they made one. Because they wanted to be absolutely right in God's sight. So the Pharisees were very, very committed to their religion, very committed to their faith, and so was Paul. He made prayers every day in the synagogue. He taught in the, in the synagogues. He went to the temple at the required times. He did alms. He did all that was required under the law. He was a dedicated keeper of the law. As for zeal, he says, persecuting the church. You know, uh, at that time, the Christians were rising up. And the Jews were concerned that, that uh, this new sect, as they would re refer to them, the, the people of the way, the people of Jesus, was going to take over the whole of their faith. And uh, they were concerned about it. So they, they brought in some, some hired guns. And Paul, of all of the hired guns, was top gun. He was the guy who they were depending on to quell the rebellion. And they gave him a mandate. You persecute that those people. And we give you full permission to go from place to place and to take them and put them in prison and, and if necessary, kill them. We know that at the stoning of Stephen, Saul was there, Paul was there, and he was giving assent to the murder of the first martyr of the church, which was Stephen. And then it says in, in Acts chapter 9 that uh, uh, he was given a mandate for further persecution of the church. It says in verse 9 and verse 1, Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Well, that's who he was. And now, Saul, meet Jesus. He was on the way to Damascus, and it was, it was midday. And suddenly there was a light that shone around him that outshone the sun. He was hit by the lighthouse. Jesus, the light of the world, shone upon him. And immediately he was blinded. And all he could hear was a voice. And he asked that voice, he said, Who are you, Lord? Because he knew this one was no one other than the Lord God. And he said, the voice answered, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Paul, meet Jesus. Now the rest of the words here in 1 Timothy 
chapter 1, tell us Paul's personal testimony. This is how Paul expresses it. We'll read it together, at least the first couple of verses, from verse 12 to verse 14. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Now, this is, as Paul, this, this is how Paul gives his testimony. Now, some of us might say, well, you know, this testimony doesn't sit very well with me, but it, because it doesn't really say up front that Paul confessed his sins. No, he says that later. Just remember that Paul was a Pharisee. And the Pharisees believed that they kept the letter of the law perfectly to the T. So Jesus, when he first met Paul, did not come to him like he came to to. Uh, Thomas and show his hands and his feet and say, look at the marks, the marks of my suffering. This is the, the, the sufficient payment of your sins. Will you trust me as Savior? Now, we like testimonies like that because they, they kind of flow nicely and they fit in with our theology. All right? That's not how Paul got saved. Paul got saved not because Jesus came as the meek and mild and humble Savior that he is, and showed him the marks of his suffering, Paul got saved because he got whapped by the Lord. Boy, some of us need to get zapped. We need to get knocked off our high horse. We need to get humbled. We are in the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Get down on your knees. And that's exactly how Jesus came to Paul. Paul, you think you're a big man? I'm going to humble you. I'm going to blind you. I'm going to put you in the dust on the road. And you're going to be led by people who you thought were your enemies, and they're going to give you, by my grace, they're going to give you your sight back. And you're going to learn how to follow me. That's how Paul starts his testimony. He says, I met Jesus, and now I know who the Lord is. It's not me. It's Jesus. Jesus is the Lord. And so you find in verse 12, he calls him Jesus, Christ Jesus, the Lord. And he appointed me. He gave me a new appointment. Some of us have, are so goal-oriented in this life, and we think we know what we're appointed to. We think we know where we're going and what life is all about. And some of us are a little bit farther on in life, and we, we're very disillusioned because now we... We thought we had it all figured out, and now we don't have it figured out anymore. What's the purpose in life? I want to tell you what the purpose in life is. It's to follow Jesus. That's what the purpose in life is. Purpose in life is to follow the Lord, who is the Lord. King of kings and Lord of lords. He appointed me to a service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I love this. The Apostle Paul, a few minutes before he met Jesus, would never have called himself a blasphemer. I worship the true and living God. It's, it's Jehovah of the Old Testament, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the moment he met Jesus, he knew he was a blasphemer because he'd taken the name of the Son of God in vain. I tell you, another proof that Jesus is God, because Paul says to take Jesus' name in vain is tantamount to taking God's name in vain. He, Paul repented and he said, I'm a blasphemer. One minute, I'm a lover of God. The next minute, I'm a blasphemer. One minute, I'm, I'm on a holy war. A holy war. The next minute, I'm a persecutor and a violent man. You see how he turned? Completely. And Jesus made all the difference, turned him right around. He saw who he truly was. He saw his true stripes when he measured himself according to the greatness and the glory of Jesus Christ. 
He repented, and he knew the truth. The truth. I'm a blasphemer, and I need mercy. Oh, I need mercy from the Lord. Twice he says this. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. And you know what? You may not know who the Lord is today. I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you. You may be ignorant of the fact that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's the Lord of all. Paul said, I, I was ignorant of that. I didn't know Jesus was the Lord. On that day he knew. And I trust that today you will know who the Lord is. And then he says, the grace of the Lord was poured out on me along with the faith and love which were in Christ Jesus. He received the blessedness of salvation from the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on in his testimony, part, part two of his testimony. It starts in verse 15, and he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Yes, he got uh, into a repentance mode. He saw his sin. He saw his, his, the ugliness of his life. And he repented. And he said, you know what? I'm not just a sinner. I'm the worst of sinners. Sometimes we've got to get there. We've got to get down. We've got to realize how bad our sins are before we will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul did. And then he says, I was shown mercy. Once again, he uses this wonderful expression. Crying for mercy. Mercy. I was shown mercy. Oh, to be in that place takes humility to ask for mercy. takes humility. And Paul says, I needed mercy, and I was shown it. In the introduction to uh, 1 Timothy, it says in, in verse 2, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. You know, it, at the introductions of, other, of his other letters, he just says grace and peace. And in 1 Timothy and in 2 Timothy alone, uh, there's, these are the only two books where he says grace, mercy, and peace. You know why he puts that mercy in there? He was thinking of how God showed him mercy. He says, I'm the one who gets the mercy. I'm thankful to the Lord for the mercy that he showed me. You ever gotten to the point where you needed mercy? Well, I tell you, you're at that point today. You need mercy, and the Lord will give you the mercy if you will trust him as Lord and Savior. And then it says, so that Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example to those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. That's the gift of salvation that the Lord has to offer. He is the dispenser of eternal life. There's salvation in no one else. There's eternal life in no one else. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And some of you are saying, Jim, this is very politically incorrect. Because Canadians are supposed to be non-judgmental and all-inclusive. And we're supposed to make peace with other beliefs. Once the Apostle Paul met, met the Lord... There, there was, there was no, no, no room for some kind of an insipid inclusiveness. They said, Jesus is the Lord and there's nobody else. Nobody. He's the one and only. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ to get saved. And Jesus gives us eternal life. So thoroughly was Paul changed that uh, he... was able, after giving his testimony, to give true worship to God. This Pharisee, who many times had mouthed the Shema and mouthed the prayers of the Old Testament, now had a true understanding of the glory of God. He says in verse 17, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now he really knows God. Once you've met Jesus, you really know God. Because Jesus is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. Now you know how good and how great and how wonderful and how perfect God is. You've met his perfect son. And not only did he have a heart that was open to worship God, he had loving encouragement for Timothy. Before, he was a man with a mission to destroy, and now he's on a mission to bless. 
In verse 18, he says, Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by following them, you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. So he was able to lovingly encourage his young brother in Christ. And then lastly, he had authority to deal with those who were teaching wrong doctrine and were subverting the faith in Jesus Christ. Because he says in verse 19, some have rejected these that rejected faith in the Lord and so have shipwrecked their faith. Now, what happens if you don't follow the lighthouse? You get shipwrecked. Okay? He's talking, he's giving us a maritime example because he's talking about the light. He's talking about the lighthouse. And he says, these people have shipwrecked their faith. Why? Because they weren't looking at Jesus they weren't valuing him as the light of the world, and they lost their way, and they have shipwrecked their faith. They did not respond to the lighthouse. Now this morning, I ask you, have you responded to the lighthouse? Have you met Jesus? You've got to meet Jesus. You may have met other famous people. They're not going to save you. You have to meet Jesus. You have to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, said Paul to the, to the Philippian jailer. Believe in, in him and you will be saved. There is no other savior. There is no one else to whom we must come. We must meet Jesus. And have you believed in him? Have you given him your life? Have you put your life into his care? And have you submitted to him as Lord and Savior? Those are questions for you to answer today, and I trust you answer in the positive. You know, I'm going to tell you a sober truth. Sooner or later, every single one of us is going to meet Jesus. Because God has given him authority to judge the world. And on that final day, on Judgment Day, when you stand before God, you will see none other than the form and the person of the exalted Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be sitting on the judgment throne. Sooner or later, everyone will meet Jesus. I don't know if this actually happened or if this is an ur urban legend, but they tell me it happened. It's a transcript of an actual radio conversation of a U.S. naval ship with Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland in October 1995. Radio conversation released by the Chief of Naval Operations, 101095. Americans, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Canadians, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. Americans, this is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Canadians, no, I say again, you divert your course. Americans, this is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. Canadians, this is a lighthouse, your call. When the Americans met the lighthouse, they had to shift. Otherwise, there would be disaster. When you meet the Lord, you're going to shift. It's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. You either shift now or you shift later. And when you shift later, it's too late to avoid shipwreck. You'll be condemned because you didn't have a savior before you died. See, now is the time to shift. Now is the time to bow the knee, as Paul did on the road to Damascus 
and to say, Lord, I'm going to shift. I'm going to get under the Lordship of Christ and I'm going to trust you as the Savior. I want to meet the lighthouse in a good way and not meet the lighthouse by accident. Are you going to trust in the Lord? May help you. May the Lord help you to do so. If you want to talk about that, I'll be available after the meeting to discuss those things with you. Could you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 before we break bread together? Very familiar passage. In verse 23, And this is the Apostle Paul describing this beautiful feast of remembrance that we have before us, the bread and the, and the cup. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is a remembrance feast. It's really a picture of Jesus and his love for us, how he gave himself on the cross. The body of Christ is pictured in the bread. The blood of the Lord Jesus is pictured in the cup. What a wonderful picture. Now, when I, well, what? When I was preaching a few minutes ago, I told you some famous people I've met. I didn't tell you, well, I told you how I met the most important person in my life, which, which is Jesus. I didn't tell you how, how I met the second most important person in my life, which is my wife, Kathy. We were at a young people's meeting, and I'd never met her before. And uh, uh, you know that song from South Pacific, you know, uh, that love song about how you meet across a crowded room? That's, that, was, uh, that was Kathy and me, because I saw her across a crowded room, and she had her back turned to me, and I saw her beautiful strawberry blonde hair, and she's tinkered with it a bit since then, but don't worry about that. Uh, still beautiful. But uh, I said, boy. If she looks that great from the back, how is she going to look from the front? She turned around, and I was, boom, I was smitten. And uh, talk about love at first sight. And I thought, boy, i got to get to know this lady. And I made efforts that evening, even though she was dating another guy. I made sure that didn't happen. And, and uh, uh, she gave me a picture. And uh, I took that picture back to medical school at the University of Toronto. I took it with me. And, and you know, it warmed my heart. Every time I, I wanted to, to, to remind myself, I took out that picture and I looked at my, at my, at that time she was my intended. And it warmed my heart. How wonderful it is to have remembrances of loved ones. And that's exactly what this is. It's the remembrance of a loved one. Now, I, I must caution you. If you don't know this person, you can't remember him. So if the, 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 the elements come to you, just pass them by. And I must also caution Christians. If you have unconfessed sin in your life, then this very passage tells you, deal with the unconfessed sin and ask the Lord to forgive you and cleanse you, and then eat of this feast. Be prepared, because it's a holy, holy communion. May the Lord bless us as we remember him. Father, we thank you for such a, a wonderful remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ, so simply constructed as a beautiful little meal, some bread and some wine, which is juice of the, of the grape. And we thank you, Father, for this, uh, this uh, feast and for the person who we remember this morning, the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us, how he shed his blood on Calvary's cross so that we, sinners, and as Paul said it so poignantly, the chief of sinners could be forgiven and have forgiveness and, e and eternal life. So we take it in fond remembrance. We take it thankfully. We take it worshipfully. 
And we say, thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Thank you for making me whole. Thank you for giving to me thy salvation so rich and free. In Jesus' name, amen.